Generation Z have been shaped by quite a few things. Smartphones, uh, a prolonged financial crisis, and a decade of social activism, and now a kind of a global viral pandemic, which is, so it's a pretty good starting lineup for Generation Z. Uh, I think that it's important to say that we're definitely not a monolith, but we do have a lot of traits that are gonna serve us really quite well throughout the rest of our lives. And I feel like it's important to young people listening to know that this is you in your generation, but especially older people listening, because these are the things you need to understand about Generation Z. Uh, look, we're researchers and fact checkers, Kind of with, with, with. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the House Hack podcast. Excited for you to be joining us today. Our guest today is Jenk Oz. Jenk is a 16 year old social entrepreneur, change activist, accomplished musician, DJ, presenter, and public speaker. In April 2020, he launched a social enterprise called Thread Media, aimed at teens and young adults that is powered by Gen Z and social change. You can find Jake on Instagram and LinkedIn and thread at thread.com. Jake, really, really excited to get into today. Quite the introduction. Thank you very much for having me. It's very kind. I uh, hope I can live up to that now for you. So yeah, happy to be Certainly here. Certainly hope so. Certainly hope so. No doubt you will. We'll be diving into all things kind of Gen Z, unlocking the potential of Gen Z. But really to, to start off with, let's, let's think about thread. So in, in your own words, what does thread do? Well, uh, look, I think Thread Media is a social enterprise that focuses on kind of four things. Uh, publishing, media, consulting, and production, all of which aimed at Generation Z. Uh, we really are aimed at teens and young adults, uh, and we kind of, we try our best to speak their language. So it's effectively the language of Generation Z. Uh, and all the topics that we cover are culturally relevant to Generation Z. Uh, the content will span across a spectrum of things from online education to collectivism uh, through to offline activism. Uh, think about kind of online activism as raising awareness to things, uh, signing petitions, uh, fundraising, and then offline action is things like field protests, uh, projects, volunteering, kind of social change organizations that will eventually lead to kind of change at a governmental level. And that's kind of the things we do. Amazing. Love that. So really talking the language of, of Generation Z, I think that's the, the key there of actually communicating to young people by young people in, in that sense. And um, maybe that's something to, to talk about as well in the sense of, you know, you're not a, a corporate organization trying to talk to Gen Z, you're, you're Gen Z yourselves. Yeah, precisely. And is there any you know, what's the, the kind of key benefit from that that, that you're seeing at, at the moment, having been running it for uh, the last, well, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 perfect. But I think, I mean, to summarize, I think the fact, the fact that we're kind of all a part of Generation Z makes it very easy to kind of tap into the market and really understand Generation Z much better. And that kind of leads to the kind of second, that kind of leads to the second pillar of Thread, because as I said before, we have the kind of the publishing pillar of Thread, but then, as you were saying just now, because of the kind of fact that we are all social change, we're very Generation Z based, sorry, that kind of leads to the the kind of the second of the three pillars of Thread, which is the kind of consulting side of Thread. And that's the area which kind of helps us do the rest of the work. And we do all of our consulting work with uh, kind of other media companies, other partners, like different agencies, by using the fact that we know Generation Z better than anyone else. So I think that kind of adds your point. No, it does definitely. And uh, I think what I was trying to get to as well was the, the transition of thread from what used to be I cool kid as well. Yeah. So tell us a bit about that. Uh, well, in essence, I will we'll, we'll start from the very beginning. Basically, kind of, I was at day school and every Monday morning, the teacher would always ask, so what did everyone do this weekend? And uh, then the teacher would always, so what did everyone do this Monday weekend? And uh, I would always say uh, I went to this uh, kind of I went to this musical or this graffiti tunnel or I went to this or that. Whereas all my friends would say, "Oh, I went to this football match or this rugby match or I kind of sat home doing kind of nothing." Uh, so then my friends started to ask me, "Jenk, what are you doing this weekend?" Because what you're doing seems to be slightly more fun and interesting than what I'm doing. So then, kind of as the weeks progressed, uh, people start asking my mum. Their parents asked my mum, saying, "What are you doing this weekend?" Uh, because my kid really wants to join Jank. 
And kind of that kind of escalated and went about as viral as an email can do in a circle of mums at the same school. And then we kind of realised this isn't really a thing yet. People, kids don't really know what's cool to do on the weekends. So we had the idea for iCoolKid, as it was called at the time. Uh, it was effectively just a, a safe website where kids could go to get all of their kind of cool information. Then we ended up getting into a bit of an issue where I was starting to mature and the, the content was starting to mature with me, but the content was too mature for a kind of baby looking ish website, an immature website almost. And the name as well, we've realized that cool, ironically enough, wasn't that cool. And I wasn't very much of a kid anymore. So all that we had left was I, which wasn't ideal. Uh, so effectively, uh, we decided that we, there needed to be time for a kind of a rename, refocus, reposition, restructure, kind of all the re's. So around kind of the beginning of, uh, maybe end of 2019, we decided on that. And then that was when we decided to rename iCookie to Thread. We refocused it. So all the content was no longer just what's cool. It was all now 100% socially changed, social change focused content. We repositioned, so we moved the demographic from kind of eight to 13 years old, or kind of kids, to kind of 15 years old onwards and 16 onwards. Uh, and then we restructured it internally and we created a consulting side, which is, as I spoke about earlier, the kind of thread media side, the consulting side of the business. And kind of that's how that was, that, that's how that shift worked. That's a really interesting, it's kind of growing up with you. And you think having already done that and changed the brand with who you are and what you're interested in do you think that will happen over time again and that you'll instead when you get older you'll change the brand and the messaging to reflect you as a person as well i feel like when i, I have spoken i have thought about this before i feel like previously when i grew older the content grew older and that's what happened that's how we re reached thread media whereas i think that because my passion lies pretty firmly in social change, I don't believe that's going to change anytime soon. Although the kind of, because obviously with social change, social change is the kind of the changing of cultural norms over time, right? So I feel like although my specific kind of co uh, social change interests will change, for example, like a social interest could be kind of uh, climate change, plastics in the ocean, kind of equality and equ uh, equity kind of, Although my individual interest may change, I feel like my kind of overall passion and love for social change won't change. So I feel like that will always be the focus of Thread, and I will try and always aim it for, I mean, it won't be Generation Z for much longer, but I'll always try and aim it for kind of 15 to that 25 category, because I feel like those are the people who are always going to be inciting the most change, whether they're kind of millennials, Generation Z, the baby boomers, kind of Generation Alpha, I think, are coming now. I feel like, so to answer your question, no, I don't think the thread is going to ever massively reshift and refocus like iCookie did to become thread, although I may kind of tweak my interest slightly. Yeah, it's almost that common thread uh, that runs through a social change at every level. Yeah. So. I think that brings in your personal mission to what you do, but also allows the adapt adaptability going forward as well, which is really interesting. But I yeah. guess with so many different interests, and I know that intro at the start reflects on a few of them, like what part of the week are you like really enjoying? Are you enjoying all of it or do you enjoy the, the varied nature of it? Or do you feel like you get different parts of who you are from the different things you do? Well, you know, I was, I was actually thinking about this and I was, this question is like, kind of what part of the week do you enjoy? And I feel like by nature of anything that happens at the same time every week, it's never really that fun if, if it kind of if it's the same every week and it happens every week. So I feel like it's quite a hard question. But the most fun that I have is kind of just being able to uh, I think probably the most fun I have is uh, kind of calling people and saying uh, uh, kind of saying, here's what you need to do to be better kind of doing these kind of things, but kind of on a grander scale and saying, here's what generation Z, my generation are going to be like. So here's what you need to do to adapt to us. And I feel like giving those talks, I find really good fun, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you ask, that doesn't happen every week. So, yeah, but I feel like that's kind of the most fun I have. It's kind of be able to inform people. Nice. And like speaking for what you stand for Precisely. on like a lot of levels. Yeah. And no, that sounds really, really awesome as well. I guess with that, 
preface and with that experience this age and doing that you might not do it each week you do it quite often though like being on like for a ted talk and being able to go and communicate with others is there a a brand image that you have on a personal level that people often misunderstand and are there other parts of you that are you don't reflect on what you do online and through your work well i feel like people uh uh, it's kind of weird. I get the, the kind of biggest misunderstanding and it goes kind of two ways. There's two spectrums of this is that either people think this kid's an adult. He could, I kind of, and I always feel I have like so many people asking me saying, can you come to this, do this? I always feel quite badly. Cause I'm like, uh, actually I have GCSEs like next week. Uh, so I actually sometimes feel quite badly when I say I can't do things. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum, which admittedly doesn't happen as much anymore, which I'm quite thankful for, but used to happen quite often was people saying, oh, he can't do anything. He's a kid. So it's kind of like you have two sides of that spectrum. And I like to think that I'm pretty well in the middle, but, uh, that's kind of the biggest misunderstandings that you have with me, but. Fortunately, we don't have much more any here, much more any here. We don't have much, uh, kind of, we have, don't much have much of this, but we have quite a lot of this nowadays. Yeah, no, it's great to say. I mean, do you think that that change or that lessening of, of, of that one, where it's, you can't do anything. You're a kid. Is, is that because you're less of a kid now? Is that just because you've got more age behind you, more experiences behind you, would you say? Or do you think that's because you're working with better people and organizations than maybe you were at the time? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I have to apologize for the puppies who are getting slightly bothered. <laughs> no, okay. uh, I think that I haven't matured. It's just that I've matured. I think I haven't changed or matured massively is since kind of in a social change mm. aspect since kind of starting. But I do feel like people deem you as less of kind of a kid figure who can't really do anything for lack of a better term uh they deem that less once you've done more work so i feel like i've i haven't changed but i've been able to show more for myself which kind of means that i've had less of this kind of idea that he's just a kid concept but i've had but since since i've done more of it less has come out of it but i don't think i've changed massively since does that make sense i feel like I've repeated yeah myself. no i'm no, with you i'm with you and so then, you know, being, being 16, we mentioned consulting, publishing, running a social enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, personal branding a little bit as well. Is there anything that stands out as the clear advantage or, or maybe disadvantage even to, to being 16 and, and doing all of those things? Uh, honestly, I, I've, I've had a special quite a lot because it's quite surprising to some people, but I actually think it's a massive, massive advantage because I feel like, especially when we started off like all good, I mean, it, the amount of, like, the amount of people every day who could have started like a cool kid who were 40, 50, 60 years old, they would have, okay, cool, they're, they're doing that. Whereas the second you have, at the time, a kind of 13-year-old who has an idea for a company and then kind of creates the website, all of a sudden, lots of, lots of people want to kind of write press about that. So I was super fortunate in a situation because I had so much unexpected press that were kind of massively boosted the kind of the startup startup phase at like the very beginnings of the startup phase and i feel like it was massively massively useful and even still now the kind of people <clears throat> i think I, I don't know how to say this now kind of tooting my own horn but i feel like people would rather listen to a kind of 16 year old who did something as opposed to listen to a 40 year old who did something and i feel like that's also and that still happens now public speaking kind of having kind of a younger person public speak. And even when I'm listening to young people, I kind of find them more enthusiastic and easier to listen to. Maybe that's just because I'm young or maybe that's just a kind of young person thing. But I feel like my age has actually given me advantages in uh, in a way which being older wouldn't have done. Nice. Yeah, no, I love that. And one thing I'd ask you as a follow-up from that is whether actually the age can become the the challenge and you actually become in that lens where you compete with other people based on your age, you know? So having started a social enterprise company, uh, so young, are you now looking at people younger than you and see it, seeing other people get that next wave of press of like seven year old goes to Mars, you know, whatever, whatever it is today, they're like the next no, wave agree. of press. I, you're like, Oh, well, that I, could no, been I, me, you know? I do. I am seeing this massive amount of kind of, uh kind of this massive kind of wave I'm, I'm by no means saying that i started it but i am i am seeing that 
there's lots of young people who are kind of doing things and kind of getting their ideas off the ground, off the paper, into reality. And I think it's really, really good to see it. And I will obviously try my best to kind of support them all, as long as they're not making like a, a kind of side hustle to thread, in which case they're, they can they can kind of shoot. Where, but all the other ones, I'll support them. <laughs> Awesome. I think that feeds us quite into like a very important question here that underlines Generation Z and even that context of getting that early start. It's really the big potential of what Gen Z can do and what they can realize they have in themselves as well. So to start us off, Jenk, in your own terms, how do you think the potential of Gen Z is currently being underused? <sighs> I, I do I do enjoy this, this question. Uh, I feel like, look, I think there's probably, I'd say two main reasons where it's being underused. Firstly, older generations don't know how to reach us, right? And right now, because of how things work, the older generation have a large stake in, in life. So uh, they, it's not like kind of C-suite level people are making, are kind of talking to Generation Z on Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram DMs. Like that just doesn't, that doesn't happen often. Uh, and I also think that we're not very well understood as a generation. People hear kind of Generation Z speak when they're willing to listen, but they don't really understand their motivations. And I think that's kind of something that you really need to understand. As the biggest cohort on the planet, right, I think Generation Z make up like a third of people or something, like it's 33% or something bonkers. They generation Z need to be an integral part of any company's uh, ideas and movements going forward, or else you're really going to struggle when Generation Z make up the kind of the the whole workforce and you can't sell to them, you don't understand them. So I feel like to begin with, it's worth saying. I says I I really I think it's quite important to say that Generation Z have been shaped by quite a few things: smartphones, uh, a prolonged financial crisis and a decade of social activism and now a kind of a global viral pandemic which is so it's a pretty good starting lineup for generation z uh i think that it's important to say that we're definitely not a monolith but we do have a lot of traits that are going to serve us really quite well throughout the rest of our lives and i feel like it's important to young people listening to know that this is you in your generation but especially older people listening because these are the things you need to understand about generation z uh, look, we're researchers and fact checkers, kind of with, when, when Google's at your fingertips 24 seven, you might as well kind of be constantly searching things. Uh, generations that are competitive, but then again, not afraid of failure. Kind of, we have that kind of cliche of you only fail when you stop trying, kind of really dig kind of deep into us when it's very easy for us to kind of get back up and keep trying in all aspects of life, especially things like starting kind of starting websites and being a startup. Uh, because of the because of the financial kind of prolonged financial crisis, we've become very conservative and risk averse. We kind of we we would rather do things like buy a sixty pound t shirt and have the option to sell it for sixty seventy pounds, as opposed to buying ten six pound t shirts. We're kind of financially aware of how things work and much more kind of financially risk averse. Uh, I feel like as a generation, we make much healthier and better social decisions about kind of food and shopping and everything as a whole. I actually believe that we're the first generation to start a decline of kind of uh, alcohol and drug consumption in the world as any generation. Uh, and as generation, this is a, I appreciate this is because we're a young generation and lots of us still live with our families and we're still very kind of young and lots of us are children, but we are very, very influential in all aspects of life, especially major family decisions, such as things like buying cars, where to kind of, where to go on holiday, uh, the, the TVs, the computers, the houses you buy. This is things that Generation Z feel passionately about because they feel that they're empowered to have a voice on what their family does. Whereas kind of, cent not centuries, dec decades ago, kind of our parents would have said, huh, okay, and kind of thank you for, for everything that their parent, the decisions that their parents are making. I think it's a really important thing to know that we kind of feel that empowerment within our own families to be able to kind of be decisive and make those decisions. And I feel like slightly uh, kind of side topic, but I feel like people think that Generation Z have a very small attention span. I saw kind of like a little infographic that had like a goldfish next to Generation Z. It's like, haha, you have the same attention span. Haha, not very funny. And uh, I feel like 
uh, I feel like actually it's less of an attention span of, I think, seven or eight seconds is what it said. But it's actually more of an acute filtering system uh, because if I – it's more of an eight seconds to kind of grab our attention. And then once you're there, we can kind of – be, we could do whatever you want for like hours and hours on end. I mean, I could watch the same YouTube video for kind of two and a half hours straight. But if those first kind of eight seconds don't kind of grab me or I don't think I'm going to enjoy the rest, that's when I'm going to have that short attention span. And that's when I'm not going to feel enjoyed. And that's, where I think, where that number comes from. And I think it's worth saying that because I feel like uh, people look down on Generation Z almost as if we can't concentrate. And it's like, no, we can. You're just not giving us the, a reason to. And that's where thread comes in. Right. Well, it fills yeah. the gap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It gives you interesting right. content. No, it's definitely really interesting perspective. I think underlying that is the communication and understanding of different generations and being able to voice what it is that they want and be able to speak to them is often misunderstood as well. And I think that's something that comes through in what you're saying in terms of being underutilized, but also giving the background of what makes Generation Z different. So with that in mind, what is the potential of Generation Z? Is there a specific Gen Z skill set? Because they're often said digital, digital first as a as a group of people, and we have these tech skills we can bring to any company. It's often seen that we're good at marketing because of that, and even anything that's digital or taken to the internet primarily is often seen as like an inherently Gen Z skill. But do you think there's other ones from that, or is there a different skill sets for different people instead do you want do you want to slightly just re just rewrite that question so i completely understand it yeah yeah, yeah. so it, in a simple question do you think there's a specific gen z skill set or do you think there are individual advantages each people has i think there's things which lots of generation z is having common but i also think that there isn't there's obviously an aspect of I, I feel like I don't, I don't want to sound silly saying that everyone's unique, but there is an aspect of kind of variety within every person that you're going to see, which will help them in different ways. I mean, people like people in Generation Z, as I said, kind of you have those kind of overall umbrella terms, like the fact that they're fact checkers, they're confident, they're risk averse. But then you also have these kind of unique items of certain things in the, and I think those come out from from uh, those come about from different environments. So I feel like someone who is kind of very academically based will be much, much better at being able to kind of understand and think things logically and kind of there'll be a better approach to kind of being a kind of a organizer, almost as kind of CEO type person at a young, young age. Whereas you have some people who are kind of brought up in the kind of performance and kind of acting like I was kind of things where you're much more emotive and, and kind of personal and expressive. And those are the generation Zers who are going to be able to kind of incite change and become the kind of the next Greta Thunberg, the next, the people who can talk to people and incite people to do different things. So I feel like all generation Z are going to be able to make a difference, but I feel like it just depends on your environment, how you grow up, and that kind of unique individuality. It is where kind of people where you're going to thrive. So you have more logical people becoming kind of ceos and organizers and managers and more expressive people becoming kind of the public speakers of the world the kind of ins inspirations the the inspirers almost you mentioned the power of well, well actually it was greston but you just mentioned right yep. i think the key trait is authority okay. so is there one unifying I don't know, tactic thing, uh, technique almost, things that Gen Z can employ in their own lives to create some of that authority. I feel like this is one of those things where you either kind of convey authority, as you said, and you convey power or you don't convey power. And there's, there's, there's only kind of, there's only so much you can teach someone to influence people. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, as much as there's there's only so many kind of public speaking lessons and kind of performance lessons and vocal coaches that you can have but that at the end of the day it's you either you either feel passionate about it and it comes from the heart or you just don't and you're doing it because pardon me you're doing it because you can so i feel like there's nothing that i can kind of tell you to do there's no kind of tactic or pardon me sorry or there's a tactic or technique that you can kind of employ like you said 
but I really feel like it either comes from the heart or it doesn't. And where it comes from the heart, are those are the people who find it, who are as effective and as kind of as inspirational as they are. But I feel like if it doesn't come from the heart, there's nothing that you can do to to make it come from the heart almost. But you know, things as well with that, you often have met re the resistance to be able to speak your voice or speak your truth. And that oftentimes it's about continuing regardless of it to then be able to have people listen to you. Because speaking with authority maybe is one thing and speaking with passion, but then having people hear it is another. Yeah. Look, I think it's all about kind of persistence and the I actually kind of speaking of persistence, I actually heard a quite funny story. I think it was last night because I was kind of watching a documentary. Uh, you know, KFC, the, I can't remember, Colonel's son is whatever, the, the guy who does KFC. Mm -hmm. He found his chicken recipe. He went to uh, he went to a thousand and eight different restaurants before he the thousand and ninth one was what we now know as KFC. And a thousand and eight people said, "No, your fried chicken is bad." Well, uh, how mistaken they were, uh, kind of. And then that the thousand and ninth it really puts into perspective. You have people who kind of you kind of have people who give up after kind of two kind of two days or two no's effectively and i feel like that persistence is really really the thing that you have to keep going for and you have to find that persistence in you and i feel like if you don't feel passionately enough and i kind of returning to my original point if it's not coming from the heart you're not going to have that persistence so i feel like to kind of to go back to your question i feel like there's really there is no technique or tactic or there's nothing that you can do to kind of persuade someone to believe to kind of believe you. you have to believe yourself and then eventually someone will believe you yeah that's pretty pretty fair and pretty true as well and i guess the only other point i bring into this is that oftentimes as a gen setter i know quite a lot of the people that have this experience as well they often have multiple passions they have multiple things that they are willing to commit to or willing to try out and do but often the decision fatigue comes in because there's so many options and if the authority and having people listen takes time and persistence, how do they choose the option that's right for them? Is it just the one that resonates the most with them? I would reckon it's the one that resonates most with them or whichever one they think they can make the most difference with. So, for example, if I, if I felt equally passionately about, let's say, climate change or kind of a social change issue in kind of rural... Uh, Uzbekistan, I would be able to make a much bigger difference if I felt as passionately about the the issue which very little people had heard of, whereas kind of climate change, which everyone knows the concept of and everyone appreciates and has, understands and knows about. So I feel like there's a there's a point where obviously if one resonates with you more than the other, you're going to have you're going to be able to make more of an impact in the one that resonates with you the most because you're going to feel more passionately, you're going to feel it from the heart, you're going to have that persistence, and you're going to go further. But if you're genuinely saying that I have so many interests, which I feel so passionately about, then you have to think to yourself, if I really want to incite change, which one am I going to be able to make the biggest difference with? And which one can I dig the deepest into? So I feel like, and that often will be the, the either the, the best one, kind of the most worthy cause almost to, to use those words, or kind of the one which is the most unheard of, because the most one that's unheard of and the most is heard of Obviously, the one that's unheard of, you're going to be able to gain more traction with because there's only so much that you can raise more awareness for climate change with, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It, it kind of really speaks to being specific with your interests, with your goals and um, with the, the organisations or movements that you get involved in. And I think what, what it also shows is that actually, if you are going down a route where you're being interested in something there's a lot of interest in as well such as climate change which is quite a you know, saturated thing as you, as you mentioned actually choose elements within that that like like go deeper like ask why nine times it's the kind of classic thing so within climate change you might go then down to uh, ocean pollution and and then beneath that you might then go down to uh, plastic beneath that you might have a specific piece of research that says x type of plastic achieves x um statistic of, of dead turtles a year and then therefore your your choice is not climate change your thing that you're passionate about is about uh plastic and turtles right so you kind of be specific with that journey of um what it is but i i think you make a good point at the end there Jack, where it's like there's no right thing you know it's, it's just about choosing something and then 
you know, doing it and testing and, and finding it out. Look, uh, I think that for yourself. Just to add on, just to kind of add mm. on to what you just said, I feel like there are so many different areas of the world which need to be improved. And I feel like the way that I visualize social change is there's, uh, say, let's say there's 10 different topics, you know, equality, equity, kind of all the different uh, kind of the rights, animals, plants, yeah. humans, all of the above, right? It, gets, it goes on forever. Let's say there's 10 different ones. I believe that there is a ladder which kind of you go up and eventually you can max out. Everyone will be happy in all 10 of those fields. And I feel like different countries will go to different areas of all 10 of these fields at different times. But the way I see it is that eventually every country in the world will, will reach the top. But I feel like it's just that kind of you have that separation as you kind of develop further. You have the UK's, the US's kind of trying to reach that pinnacle. And then you have the kind of the ones where and actually suddenly put this in perspective for me the other day were places like the Philippines. I we had we onboarded an ambassador quite recently called Jay, who's from the Philippines. And he was talking about social change issues, which I didn't even like fathom were issues at all anymore. Things like kind of getting right, like clean running water to schools. It's like, apparently they, they've kind of just about got over the brink of getting clean water at home, but now the next step is get it to schools. And I'm, and this kind of like, it almost blew my mind because I didn't realize the, the separation of countries on a social change scale. And I appreciate that I'm kind of blurring the line now between human development and kind of social change but i feel like as human development will grow social change will grow and vice versa so i feel like it's kind of important to know that all the countries are at a different level but they're all reaching the same direction yeah no it's, it's really interesting to know and i think the kind of point on human development and um economic development you know it's fascinating because i think actually there are a lot of countries out there that are a lot further ahead than the US is the Canada, Canada's the kind of Western developed countries because they've been able, you know, and I'm not a, a development expert, but to my mind, they have skipped elements of industrialization that we experienced to go straight to technologies for like mobile, you know, yep. which we haven't really adapted properly. Um, yeah, particularly, particularly if you look at finances, for example, in, in a lot of rural areas. So yeah, no, it's fascinating, but kind of shifting the conversation a little bit, I think the other pillar of Gen Z and its relationship to the world and realizing potential is, is Gen Z in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so maybe spending a bit of time, time there and, and talking about how Gen Z can maybe take part in, but also be integrated into corporate organizations, startups, hierarchy, all of these themes, I think are going to be kind of defining the next 10, 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder what your, your take would be on how Gen Z can get their voices heard in the workplace right now. Look, I think the most important way, the most effective way that we're going to do that. So I think it does need to happen. I agree is that we need to integrate them and give them a seat at the table. And I mean, at Thread, all the seats at all the tables are all Generation Z, ironically enough, but I feel like in the kind of higher mega corporate social enterprises, there needs to be a seat at the table for someone in Generation Z to speak that voice, okay, to speak that, to speak on behalf of a third of the world, right? So I feel like it's super important for companies to create youth councils or youth boards so they can tap into on a monthly quarterly basis and be able to really understand what's happening in the kind of world of young people almost i feel like countries now countries companies need generation z now more than they ever have before and i feel like that that needs to happen because generation z as i said makes up a third of the kind of world and it, they're not going to be able to survive without the Generation Z on board. So that's why I feel like they need them pretty desperately. I think if, uh, there's a few things to mention is that Generation Z want, Generation Z want authenticity, genuineness, transparency, and kind of all of the above in all of those areas. So you kind of want to think how many kind of ads do you see that reflect those principles of traits? Okay. So kind of, how many ads do you, do you see that reflect all of those ideas? Not just one or two. You don't want to have an ad that says we're transparent, kind of 
in for lack of a better example you kind of want to be able to show yourself in all three of those lights because it's only that combination that generation z really care about look i think companies are also trying to sell a product rather than outcome or reason for example saying like a company is now saying do you want a toaster we'll go with the example do you want a toaster whereas companies should be saying do you want a wonderful breakfast I feel, I've really, I don't know why I use that example, yeah. but it kind of works. If companies are selling toasters and they should be selling breakfasts, mm. the, the idea of a good breakfast. And I feel like that's something that Generation Z will seek into because it's a classic kind of, I, I don't know if you've seen this, the classic kind of uh, Simon Sinek, why, how, and what, the kind of golden circles, but it really is that. It's not what are you selling, it's why are you selling it. Generation Z care about that why. It's because why is because you don't have it. Why is because you want this. It's not what is it it's the why and i think that's something that people need to care about and finally that things like if so climate change and this kind of social equity at the top of generation z's kind of social compass that's where our model our moral compass is facing then companies need to get involved in the conversation in a meaningful way on those topics kind of companies don't just expect companies shouldn't expect generation z to come to them they should start to expect they should go to generation z Okay, and I feel like that's the only way you're really going to be able to understand Generation Z is if you're going to where they're going, because currently Generation Z aren't really coming to big companies now because they're starting their own. So if you're a big company, and you need Generation Z in a more than just a kind of monthly cancel uh, sense. You really need to start going to Generation Z and finding them and kind of picking them out like, like, like I don't know, whatever you pick out things with. Uh, and last, I think it's important to tell you that the companies are always talking at you and not with you. I think it's a major issue, especially I think it's annoying. And I feel like all of Generation Z does as well. I feel like they they used to be the orchestrator of kind of all things. Companies used to basically run everything. Whereas now companies are just simply another voice, kind of another tweet that we see. So they need to get used to it because it's it's something that companies still think they have that massive authority Whereas now it's kind of the people that have the authority. And I feel like companies need to appreciate that. That's kind of the, I feel, I feel like I rambled on a bit there. That's kind of the first part of your question. To kind of say where kind of the workplace is going, I feel like that's kind of like a whole nother thing. And I feel like the, I feel like the most important thing and the kind of the key term in the, the future of the world of work is the gig economy, right? So it's GIG economy. I don't know if it stands or anything, but it's kind of the idea of, uh, you work for yourself on behalf of someone. So uh, Uber, Airbnb, Deliveroo, okay? These are all companies where you work for yourself on behalf of someone else. And that is the gig economy. And that is working its way up on a massive, massive kind of massive level. And it is actually not stopping. I think it's it makes up something like 25% of the jobs now and will make up uh, almost a third or half of, uh, yeah, I think it's a third of all the jobs by uh, 2030s economy, which I think is Im massively impressive and really notable. But we're gonna have a quite a big issue. And I appreciate it's kind of going into kind of the world of education as well, but we as people, as Generation Z, are being taught in schools in the same way that millennials, baby boomers, the silent generation were taught, okay? The only difference is, oh, you have a touchscreen whiteboard instead of a chalkboard right and that's the only difference we're still learning about the same things we're still kind of spending hours on the kind of quadratic formula all day what we're not learning is things that are actually going to become useful nowadays because the the world of work has changed exponentially in the last five years okay and the syllabus has changed absolutely nothing in the last 50 and we're going to have a massive massive issue when now and 10 years from now and the gap keeps getting bigger between kind of what we learn and what we need to learn and i feel like kids are having a massive issue kind of figuring out what we need to do because all of a sudden you leave universe you leave sorry school knowing kind of here's how quantum physics works and then like where'd you go from there like you need to then do kind of you have like people don't really understand how to kind of the world of work now isn't there's only so much world of work you can do in kind of quantum physics whereas what you've learned in school is now it's not not useful i'm not saying that but what i am saying is that it's not as useful as it used to be and the schools are having a massive issue because they need to change that syllabus 
to adapt to the fact that half the people in the world are going to effectively be self-employed. And I feel like that is not being accounted for and needs to be accounted for. I feel like I've gone about 12 and a half years there, but I think I made the point. <laughs> yeah, there's loads, loads to un unpack there. I think uh, particularly the kind of point of, of education. You know, we had a great episode a few weeks ago with uh, Nikita Kandwala from, from LinkedIn as well. Run, running running her own business um and part of the that conversation there just to revisit it for a second was was talking about how um business actually can can fill part of that gap right and yes you've got your, your responsibility of government policy setters but actually the key point that you make is very very true in that um school will remain the same pretty much you know give or take for, for a long long time still to come whereas what we've seen with the gig economy, as you mentioned, with, with companies innovating, um, is actually innovation, the kind of private sector moves a lot faster than education can keep up. And so because of that, then it's then saying, well, actually what companies are filling the gap, what companies are enabling people to adapt to that change. Um, but yeah, Charlie, I don't know if there's anything out of the, the beginning of what Jenk talks about that you want to pick up on. I think the self-employment part on the second one is really interesting as well. Or we might talk about education as teaching future skills, but it's more than that. It's teaching how to be self-employed, how to direct your own career. And I think this links in a lot to portfolio careers and exactly of how we choose our time and choose what we want to be involved with and how we act on other people or other companies behalf so, and that's a really interesting point of teaching the skills needed for self-employment yep. not just for work is really really important as well just just to kind of kind of elaborate what you just said because i kind of kind of triggered something in my mind or like a flashback there <laughs> it's kind of i think it's really important because we need to change the syllabus in a in a massive way as i said but i i want to kind of emphasize where that syllabus needs to change to so effectively uh, I think it's Raj Chetty kind of coined this idea, but it's, it's uh, the concept of lost Einsteins, right? And schools need to kind of understand that it is infinitely easy to spot an athlete that can run 100 meters in 11 seconds or throw a javelin kind of 400 meters. But it's really quite difficult to see an innovator or an entrepreneur, okay? And the syllabus needs to be able to understand that these athletes, musicians, performers, academics are all being kind of brought up almost kind of in a silver spoon style by these schools because they're like the golden children, the grace children. Whereas the people who are really the, the kind of golden adults are the CEOs and the entrepreneurs, right? The, the Elon Musk's, the kind of the mega titans of the world. They're all the, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, but the schools aren't seeing them and they're not finding them. And I feel like that's a massive issue because these people are kind of being, the athletes and performers are, are kind of being brought up as athletes and performers, whereas entrepreneurs and innovators are being brought up as, as kind of, I hate to say this, but they're brought up, up as average almost. And they're being left to kind of be entrepreneurs and be innovators just in silence and no one's, and no one's there to help them. So I feel like, I've said a lot about how school needs to change, but it needs to change in a way that's going to help entrepreneurs and innovators to be able to thrive and nourish their ideas and i feel like if that happens you're actually going to have the people who are kind of half on board with their entrepreneurship or half innovators becoming full innovators because they're kind of being nourished and kind of fed along the way whereas nowadays all the entrepreneurs and innovators the only reason we see them is because they were so driven and so powerful and so passionate to drive their idea forward that they actually did without the help of well, not without the help of anyone, without kind of being able to be nourished and helped by anyone. Whereas if you have someone who, oh, this is a cool idea, but doesn't really know how to kind of act on it and affect it and make change, that's the people who need to be nourished and kind of brought up and helped along the way. That's how those ideas are also going to become a thing. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have 20 times the amount of entrepreneurs per year in every school than you ever have before. And then there's, that's where your kind of human development increases. Because all of a sudden you have all these brilliant ideas that no one knew these kids had, and you're kind of bringing them all out at the same time. So I feel like that is definitely the thing. You need to be able to teach, you need to be able to change the syllabus in order to develop these moonshotter children, the kind of the children with moonshot ideas, I guess. 
and that means a seed change that a, a change at the roots of the way that you teach children okay because people who the kids who dream big and want to change the world with innovation and kind of exploration aren't being nourished and aren't able to do that because they aren't being nourished and the future of any country in the world the most developed and the least developed depend on those moonshot innovation children and if only one say the 100 moonshotters and one of them one of them feels powerful enough to be able to work on their own and has a good enough idea that will be able to kind of work and develop and it helps the country this much imagine if you had 100 of those which were all nourished and developed at the same level then you'll have 100 massive increases in this country's development and i feel like that's how the that's how the the country needs to change and the syllabus needs to change yeah, I definitely agree on that. And I think the facts don't lie here. I think it's 55% of Gen Zs want to be an entrepreneur at some point. So yeah. there's a demand for, from them as well to do it, which I think is really, really interesting. And perhaps is there any prime examples you've seen of this being implemented by some schools or by some organizations or startups who are trying to do that yeah. already? If I'm being honest, I wish I could say yes. I wish I could. I would feel so happy, so much better if I could say, yes, this school is doing a great job, but there isn't. And that's kind of, that kind of that's the, that, that's the issue. That's the thing. No schools are kind of, no schools are being able to do this. And look, 85% of the jobs needed for 2030's economy haven't been created yet. Okay. And schools are still teaching all the jobs which are actually not useful anymore because those jobs don't exist anymore. Like the jobs that we're being taught literally i'm not exaggerating they do not exist anymore and 85 percent of the jobs that will exist aren't being taught so there's there's a there's a pretty big overlap there and i don't think i'm the only person that sees it and i think it, I, there needs to be a pretty massive change there i mean look you have to be able to tip like for example the schools need to start teaching things like the un sustainable development goals you need to work through those you need to see how each of those is going to make a difference on the world and how to implement each of those goals things like okay look jobs for example would be like that the 85 percent of jobs right they'd be something like solar panel designers or kind of uh aquaponic fish farmers or kind of telesurgeons or like uh rewilders or garbage designers things like that notice all these things very very social change based but i I don't want to plug social change anymore i already have but i feel like look these are kind of it's obvious that the development and the things that we're going to be doing in the rest of our kind of time as humanity is all going to be as a measure of social change we're going to be trying to work our way up that social change ladder and i feel like the only way to do that is going to be by teaching the kids at, at their youth how to do that and we're quite frankly failing to do so yeah, no, it's really interesting. It's the kind of cl ca classic catch-22, funny enough, um, because schools, they can, can basically not win in, in any scenario because they're always going to be pushed in one direction by funding and targets and all of those things, but they're always going to be pushed in another direction when people like us are going, hey, guys, we've come out the other side, you need to change or whatever. Um, yeah, and to be fair, there is an aspect where... Uh, there is an aspect where the kind of the time it takes from us having this idea to change the syllabus to making the government change to then actually implementing it you're already two years late so i feel like i do i do appreciate that it's not as easy as teach this no exactly it, it's always easier said than done these things but no i i think we've i think we've summarized some really really good points um but thinking about the kind of coming to, to the close of, of our conversation Really, what does the future of, of Gen Z uh, look like, Jen? What are we what are we predicting? What does the future look like? Oh, I think the future is the future of Generation Z is is undefined, obviously, because it's the future. But if the future of Generation Z, sorry, I can rephrase. I'm going to start that question again. The future of Generation Z is obviously undefined, but there is kind of two parts. There's the path where nothing on a government level changes and you have you still have the same one in every hundred people maybe two in every hundred because generation z are quite passionate 200 in every people kind of becoming entrepreneurs becoming innovators doing their thing becoming successful there you go 
That's one path, and that's where very little things happen. That's where social change will happen at the same rate and scale that it's happening at now, okay? And you're gonna have massive kind of gaps in social change. Then you have option two, which is the option I would much prefer, which is where change happens on a governmental basis and on a, on a worldwide basis, kind of syllabus is change, people understand how Generation Z works, and then that's when it kind of all really starts to kick off. That's when you start to nourish and enjoy these lost Einsteins. You start to be able to help them to ideate their ideas. Then all of a sudden you have 20 in every 100 people who are creating businesses, who have these brilliant ideas. Then they're going to be able to help the world or their country in a specific and new way. Then that country is going to be able to develop at a massively quicker rate and kind of work its way up the social change ladder in a massively quicker rate. And that is going to help the world in the long run. And I feel like you, as a as a country, almost as a world, you have to choose which way you want it. Because we have Generation Z. Generation Z is kind of like, we're happy to do whatever's going to happen in our future. So whether you guys, the kind of, the older people want to make insight change and teach us differently so that we can make the world a better place when we're older, then that's your choice. But if you don't want to, then we're just going to repeat what you did. If anything, slower and at a worse rate because the world is changing and Generation Z isn't. Or you can insight change and Generation Z will make a difference at a much quicker rate and the kind of the world will kind of do well and there'll be flowers and fireworks. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll definitely create the, the utopia that we're, 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 we're positioned to, you know, and I, and I think that's part of the challenge that we maybe haven't spoken about too much, isn't it, is the kind of pressure that that, that, that puts on Gen Z to say, oh, actually, we've got all these problems, all of these challenges, you mentioned financial um, challenges, COVID, all of, the, all of these influences in terms of behaviour, and then older generations go okay guys you know you've got all this potential figure it out you're gonna you're gonna be great you know so actually it's it's almost reverse engineering that pressure to say well yes we want to have an incredible amount of change to how things currently are but what's the priority what 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 is it that actually yeah meant that change was needed in the first place and i think you make a good point in terms of building on the foundations of things like the sustainable development that- goals if you kind of have the baby boomers and I actually can't remember the name, of the, what's, the, what's the generation in between baby boomers and millennials? No, I can't, I, maybe there I is one. Maybe, yeah. maybe, I'm, maybe I'm kind of imagining age. Uh, but if you kind of have these baby boomers, they think that uh, they think that the world is happy to continue as it already is. Maybe a few changes to climate change, maybe a few changes here and there, but they're pretty confident that the world can keep on increasing in development and social change rates at a constant level and Bob's your auntie, everyone's happy. But what we don't realize is there is a massive, massive amount of untapped potential, which if tapped into will make a massive, massive difference. And I feel like that's kind of, at the end of the day, that is what it really, that is, that is what it kind of matters. And I feel like baby boomers almost have the decision here to say, we can incite change for once we're long gone and Generation Z are kind of in kind of their 50s, 60s, 70s, you can either have a massive difference or you can have the same difference as we were when we were that age. So I feel like that's where it really comes in. Also, I just want to give a quick example of, I've just thought about this as I was speaking about this, as a kind of a lost Einstein situation. The, the example I quite like to use is Starbucks, right? Starbucks is a cafe. There, there was millions of cafes beforehand but what does Starbucks do? Starbucks, uh, someone had the idea to put a uh, someone had the idea to put a, a, a sofa and a coffee table in Starbucks, and that's why Starbucks became Starbucks. And I feel like people don't appreciate that how I mean how many people must have had the idea. And this kind of this goes into Lost Einstein's as well as going into kind of uh, go for it mentality almost. Like you'd rather you the way that I like to think about it is. You should never fear failure. You should always kind of be terrified of regret. And that's kind of my my golden mantra. And the reason I talk about Starbucks is because the amount of people that must have had the idea to put a sofa and a table into a coffee shop so that people can sit while drinking their coffee must have been a, a, a lot of people, I presume. It's not rocket science. But the person who did it is now the founder of Starbucks. In the same way that 
oh god, I wish there was a website where I could put my face on it and other people could put their face on it, and it was like a book of people. Hmm. But Mark Zuckerberg made Facebook, so I, I think that, that kind of, it's kind of my golden rule that you should never fear failure, you should always fear regret. And I feel like, it's slightly sidetracked, but I feel like people need to hear that, and it's quite interesting. Nice, awesome. I think it's probably a final point that underlines everything we talked about today, which is individual empowerment and really giving people both the tools, but also really just the confidence to start. And I think, yes, it comes down to how the generations before us allow us to do that, but also it comes down to us and how we enable each other to do it as well. And I think a big part of what we're seeing is rising amounts of communities around that and people that can help each other in this disconnected world of people doing their own self-employment route, their own freelancing to be connected and grow together still. So I think that's a really big part of this journey is that it's not just about how companies can do things for us or how other people can help us. It's also about how we can help one another as a generation as well. Yeah, I could be agree. I, I back that. I have nothing more to add to that. To be fair. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I think I think it's possibly originally Jeff Bezos who, who talks about regret and minimization um, as a kind of key principle um, when making decisions. You know, so you've got all these different paths laid out in front of you, and kind of harking back to what we said originally of like what's the right thing, the right passion to choose. You know, kind of visualize ahead and think about what um, you will enjoy the most kind of all the positive aspects yes but also think about those negative aspects as well and think actually what will i regret not doing the most or, or, or the kind of other side of it is definitely interesting to think about um yeah. but yeah uh, before we sign off jake let's let's talk a little bit about um you know, we talked about social change and collectivism but we know that you've got your recent ted talk as well so do you want to just tell us a bit about that uh, well, my TED talk, yes, I, I did. I did my uh, second TED talk, and it was about the idea about the, it, the title is "Can Like Save the World uh, or Change the World?" And I actually start by saying, "No, it can't." But millions of likes can change millions of people's opinions, and millions of people's opinions can change the world. So, and effectively, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But the topic is how can collectivism so online activism, especially in the situation of COVID-19, how can you make a difference using collectivism and how is collectivism effective and effectively is, is about collectivism. And I, not to plug myself, but uh, please do listen. I, I'd like to think it was quite interesting. Uh, and I think that's the, yeah, that's the kind of concept of the TED talk. And I think that it's really important because, I think collectivism is important because People don't understand how effective it is. And people don't understand how kind of people, a lot of people like to dismiss collectivism because I've heard lots of people say the kind of collectivism is kind of like a lazy activism. It's for the people who can't be asked to get off the sofa and they're just using their phone to repost stories. But it's not that. It's it's the people who kind of it's the people who are talking about things. It's the people who are kind of talking about things in forums, discussing things in kind of Discord servers, discussing things on Twitter, on Reddit, on, and then signing petitions, raising funds, all things you can do online. And I feel like people don't appreciate the the effort that collectivism takes. And I, I talk about that, and I talk about the, ch the change that it's able to make and the change that it has made, the advantages, disadvantages, and so on and so forth. Awesome, no, thank you for that. And yeah, definitely check it out. I'll make sure I link it in the description. Really talking right. about the power of kind of compound compound change. Really, really interesting. Listen. So, Jank, all that remains just to say thank you so much for jumping on to the podcast today. Hope thank you had a good time. So, so, so much. It's very kind of you to have me. It's nice to see you both. And I will uh, we'll catch up very soon. Everyone who's listening, thank you for listening. See you.